You're listening to Bad Dog Agility, bringing you training tips, interviews, and news about the great sport of dog agility. I'm Jennifer. I'm Esteban. And I'm Sarah. And this is episode 264. Today's podcast is brought to you by hitaboard.com. Hitaboard.com has the innovative training tools you need for agility. Having problems with the dog walker A frame? The Hitaboard can fix that. Your dog doesn't like tugging? They'll love the tug it. Can't move your A frame around by yourself? The move it can. Go to hitaboard.com and use discount code BDA10 to get 10% off your order. That's hitaboard.com. Today, we're going to be talking about extending obstacles and how that relates to your training and handling. Yeah, I think this is a group of obstacles that we don't talk about very much. And frankly, I think we don't train enough, especially here in the United States. Specifically, we're talking about the tire, uh, the double, also known as the ascending. I guess two different versions. The bar can be set, both bars can be set at the same height. Right. That's the double. And then in other places, the the first bar is a little bit lower than the second bar, the back bar. So that you would call an ascending. I think of them as the same. So I I will often say double for both of those. Uh, The triple, the broad jump, and the panel, and the wall or the viaduct, right? The the big monstrosity of a thing usually you see in international uh, handling. And so all of those obstacles, I like to call them the extending obstacles because both by nature of the obstacle itself, uh, being kind of uh, bigger or more intimidating, the dogs tend to take off a little bit earlier. They land a little bit longer. They are less willing to turn over the obstacle. And uh, we basically never teach them to, for example, wrap those obstacles. And, um, uh, you know, the handlers and even judges and course design give them a lot of room and a lot of space. So you often see like big, big air on these obstacles. So these are things that are going to extend your dog. And when you walk the course, you need to kind of incorporate that into your walkthrough. When you kind of plan, where does my dog take off? Where does my dog land? What is the turn going to look like here? Uh, Jen, what do you think about this? Yeah, I've always called these the specialty jumps. So when I teach or refer to them to my students, I say, okay, there's six specialty jumps. Um, But you're right. I mean, what makes them special is not only their physical appearance, but the fact that these are often going to be taken with a lot of extension. Now, some of them can be done with more technical jumping efforts. Um, You know, you could teach a panel or a tire with more wrapping. But if we think about how they're used on course, they're less likely to be used in that manner. I mean, Mm. even the broad jump in USDAA is actually referred to as the long jump as opposed to the broad jump, implying that the dog is going to be jumping long or jumping big. So there's definitely special considerations that need to be taken with these six jumps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that um, another way to think about them, in addition to being extension jumps, is that they force direction in a way that a normal jump doesn't. And that's where I think the panel and the tire are... um, a a little bit different than, you know, as Jennifer said, you, the dog has to have more extension to clear a double, a triple, um, a wall abroad for sure, right? They don't necessarily need more extension to clear a tire or a panel. It's no, it's really not that much larger than a regular jump, but it does force a direction. A dog cannot slice a tire, for instance, uh, in the way that they can slice a single bar jump. Well, they can a little bit. So let's approach this one obstacle at a time just very quickly, because you're right. Each of these obstacles are unique. And let's start with the tire since you're already talking about it. And the first issue that I think a lot of people run into is which hole is my dog going to go through? You know, it's not just a circle here in the middle because of the strings that are attached to the tire itself, to the framework, it kind of creates several different spaces the dog can go through. And um, I actually found it helpful to uh, set my dog up in, in the learning in the teaching uh, at different angles so that the dog learns to approach it and, and look for the tire aperture, right? And so the dog may not jump fully on a slice because as you pointed out, the physical, uh, the, the nature of, of the tire changes the width of the aperture, right. right? The whole like literally shrinks the more angled you get. And then the dog kind of needs to square themselves up. It's as if they were approaching, say, a dog walk or a teeter from a 90 degree angle. Or they a have tunnel. to square themselves up, right? <laughs> You know, it's going to be a little bit different. And so the dogs need to get comfortable with that. But I find that people don't do that. 
Like they're not going to send their dog 90 degrees or even as a backside to the tire. But think of it as a very useful skill. If you could say tire and orient yourself in the tire in, in practice where it's just, you know, one obstacle out there on the field, and then they got to go and, and find the opening, you know, and what that, in my opinion, what that's going to do is give them a lot of confidence so that when they see it in flow, right, they know that, hey, I don't need to take off from super far away. Um, the other thing that they have to figure out is how do I jump to clear the tire without banging my head or my back up against the upper top of the tire, right? So that's a little bit different from the other obstacles as well. Jen, what kind of um, uh, work are you doing with your students uh, in person with the tire? So I think one thing that's important to add into the tire for all of our AKC listeners out there is remember that the tire is going to be one jump height lower than your other jumps. So I don't think this is going to change what skills you need to teach or or really how you're going to handle it. But I do find that for a lot of people, it gives them a little bit more confidence in what they're willing to ask their dog to do because mm-hmm. the dog's less likely to hit it. Right? They're less likely to hit it because it is a bigger, bulkier obstacle and takes more weight to crack it open. But you know, when you have a 20-inch dog and now the tire is at 16, you know, you might be more willing to ask for a wrap because you know the dog's jumping lower. However, the flip side of this, and as you mentioned, is the dogs could overjump and hit the top of the tire. So for a lot of dogs who are going middle of the course, everything's 20, they get to the tire and they try to jump 20, they may risk uh, hitting the top of it. So I think that's a special accommodation. I think one that that brings up a lot of discussion as to whether or not lowering the tire was really a good move on the part of AKC. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not Mm -hmm. a huge fan of it. I understand the intent, which was for safety, but they also then at the same time changed to you must have a breakaway tire. Uh, so I feel right. like that kind of covered it. But uh, we have at our facility one of the um, the saloon door tires, and I find this to be much easier to teach on. So we teach with the saloon door tires uh, in the lower levels where there is no frame, right? So basically, it's kind of a freestanding tire. What this does is it allows the handlers to get a little bit closer to help the dog, to lure the dog through, to get more reinforcement. But mm-hmm. it also gives the dogs less openings. To jump options, through, right? Yeah. You mentioned the strings and the side partitions and going under. There's a lot less options. So it kind of highlights and focuses the circle, the actual tire. And once the dog builds better understanding, higher reinforcement rate for going through the tire, then we transition them over to the bigger frame, that more traditional AKC frame. Uh, and, and I find that that is a very helpful way to go about things. Um, we also see in AKC so frequently the tire is the first obstacle. So Mm -hmm. one thing that we do with the tires, we do a fair amount of letting it be the first obstacle so handlers can figure out what distance setup is appropriate. Uh, You know, Mm -hmm. you're not going to see the triple as a first obstacle. It's not legal in any organization as far as I'm concerned. So we never practice that. But the tire is one we see a lot. Mm -hmm. So we get handlers comfortable with what is the proper setup distance, making sure they can recall through the tire because Mm -hmm. you're more likely to recall through the tire than some of the other obstacles. So those are a few adjustments we make. Yeah, I also like sticking the tire in front of the dog walk, um, especially at international heights. Let's say you have a dog, they normally run 20 inches. Um, there were some extremes in the past where you might have a 16-inch dog who who has to jump 26 inches. And what happens is when you jack up the tire, they can actually like see the dog walk under uh, it, <laughs> under it, and they just run right under it. They don't and, you know, even see I, it. it. Yeah, it's like they don't even see it. So that's a special consideration to uh, keep in mind. I think that's less of an issue these days given the – the uh, changes in jump heights. Um, okay, let's move on to the uh, the double or ascending. I think we can a little bit kind of lump this with the triple. And, and my question for both of you is, what bar is the dog looking at? So we, we know that dogs, some dogs look more at wings, some dogs look at the bar. Ideally, we want the dogs to look at the bar. But let's say we have a dog that's a very good jumper. They look mostly at the bar. And now they got to figure out, what bar is the high bar, especially if we're looking at the ascending, but even if you look at the double, like which bar is going to, where do we want the the apex, the peak of their curve as they jump over a, a, an obstacle? Where do we want that peak to be? Like, what is the dog uh, deciding? Jen, what are your thoughts? So an ascending spread and a true parallel double, in my mind, are actually different jumping efforts. So if you think about a dog's rounded arc, the highest point of their arc would be centered if we're thinking about a regular jump, you know, let's say an inch, let's say they give themselves an inch clearance Mm -hmm. right over the bar. 
So when you talk about an ascending spread, the first bar should just fall under that arc. So essentially the arc for an ascending spread could be very similar to the arc for a regular jump. But mm-hmm. if you think about a parallel double, if they center their arc over the first bar, then that means that they are descending as yes. they come over the second bar and can hit it. If they center their arc over the second bar, then that means that they could still be ascending and hit the first bar. Mm-hmm. So what bar of a double the dog hits can give you a lot of feedback. So what, really what I look for my dogs to do is try to center their arc over the middle and then also jump a little bit extra clearance. So if on a regular jump, they're only giving themselves a quarter of an inch or a half inch clearance on a double, their arc does actually need to be adjusted and and shifted. So I know for AKC, there's rules to help visually cue the dog, which one it is. For example, if it's a parallel double, you need to have two crossbars. So you need to create an X underneath. If it is an ascending double, you only have one crossbar as a diagonal. Now, whether or not people are out there training this, whether or not the dogs are figuring it out, I can tell you for me, that is not something that I'm super consistent about in training. I try to yeah, get them to look at the bar as opposed to the wing and mm-hmm. not pay attention much to the crossbar. But ascending doubles, I do think are a little uh, easier, a little better. The jumping effort's more consistent. But what I'm also seeing is as dogs do more ascending, then when they have the parallel ones, the bar comes down. So we've had judges uh, do ascending on Friday, Saturday, and then parallel on Sunday. And you will see that bar come down at a much higher rate because the dogs aren't adjusted to it. Yeah, I 100% agree yeah, with you. I, I totally um, think of an ascending double as much more like a triple than like a double. Um, when we were, you know, thinking about uh, these, uh, these um, obstacles for the exact reasons that you said, it's just a, a completely different focus for the dog. And, and um, I was going to, to mention, uh, as you said, that, you know, I, I find the triple, even though it is a larger obstacle. I think for a lot of dogs, it is an easier obstacle for for that exact reason. All they really are doing is jumping that last bar and the rest of it just falls underneath their uh, natural arc. You know, maybe they can't get quite as close for like a popover, but you're never going to be asking them for that um, type of uh, jump because of the course design requirements that come with uh, Well, you won't ask ask them to do that in a trial because that'll never be required. Right. But uh, you know, I think that in training you absolutely should and yes. you should do the angled approaches. And this is why how many of us see dogs taking off and they are clearly using the first bar as the apex point, right? Because right. they're big, right. they, they yeah. take off super early. They, it, they got a long flat trajectory and they are, barely clearing the third bar, oftentimes knocking that third bar. Right. And to be, to be crystal clear here, to, to go back to some of the stuff you were talking about with the tire, how we would set them up at the angle. The reason that we do this in training is not because we will ever see it or need it in a trial. That is not the point. The reason we are doing this in training is to um, help our dogs understanding to, to give them um, greater understanding of exactly what this obstacle is and how it works so that uh, they do it more appropriately um, in the ring. So it's, it's not, you know, these angled approaches or even uh, I'm sure we'll talk about it in a second, but even asking our dogs to do a backside on a wall, you know, that's not something that I think is legal anywhere but we will still do it because if our dog can do that and they can still um, estimate their takeoff point correctly and keep all of the bars up or the bricks up or whatever, then they are far more likely to be able to take it in flow correctly. Well, but yeah, it, 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 you're taking the guesswork out of it, right? Yes. So think about those movies you see where they have those chases and they end up on the rooftops and the bad guys chasing the good guy, the good guys <laughs> trying to get away. Wait, no, maybe the good guys chasing the bad guy and the bad guys trying to get away. You want to know in advance, like if you're, if you and I are suddenly in that situation and we get to a, a spot where we have to jump or, or fall to our deaths, if we don't make, to rooftop. Like we don't know what we can do because we've never tested ourselves. Right, right. You know, we don't know if this is an easy jump or an impossible jump and you're definitely going to die. Right. Right. And that would be great information to have. And I assume the bad guys who steal diamonds and, and things like that, they have a lot of experience here. They know I, I can jump pretty much this far in here. We're right on the border. This is a gamble. And so your dog is kind of the same way. And right now, basically, most people's dogs are just, they make sure they take off early. They hit it with max speed, maximum jumping. Let's just clear this thing. Let's get some air over this. We don't want to knock it. And 
I would like to point out that if you only ever show your dog these obstacles from straight on, they actually don't like, it's like having a two dimensional picture. It's like looking at pictures of a triple or pictures mm. of a broad or pictures of a double. They only have one perspective and that doesn't give them depth right? That doesn't give them great depth perspective um, or anything like that. So it's all, I almost think of it like triangulation. If you only ever show them one view of it, um, they, they, cannot try, they can't create a 3D model in their head of what this obstacle really looks like, right? Like if mm -hmm. you think about, um, I don't know, like a, a Tony Stark movie, an Avengers movie with all of the high-tech gizmos, what do they always do? They, they look at things from all angles and then they create this little three-dimensional model that they can rotate in space with their hands right. to try to you know understand the, the spatial aspects. And so us in our training, when we give our dogs all of these angles, we are letting our dogs create a, a more accurate understanding and picture in their mind of what this obstacle really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like that. That's good. And then how does that relate to something like the broad jump? Well, let me ask very quickly. Uh, you mentioned USDA calling the broad jump the long jump. Uh, uh, I think of it as the broad jump. And then what about the spread? What exactly is a spread when people say spread jump? I think, I mean, and if I recall correctly, hopefully nobody will call me out on this. In USDA, it's considered an ascending spread. It's not a double or triple. There is no triple, right? It's an ascending mm. spread. It may have three bars, but it's not called a triple. So an ascending spread is more of kind of that ascending double or ascending triple. I think it, it really just comes down to verbiage. I don't yeah. think gotcha, the gotcha. long jump and the broad jump are the same obstacle with the different um, regulations in terms of size, in terms of how tall the right. broad jump versus the long jump is, how long the broad jump or long jump is. And like overseas, internationally in FCI, there is no double or triple. It's just considered an ascending spread. So, yeah. you know, two bars, first one at a lower height, and then there's usually a range as far as how wide that they can be. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for the clarification. So on the broad jump now or the long jump, I know that there are kind of two versions, right? The one that if, if let's say you're running a big dog and you've got five of those planks constituting right. the broad jump, right? There's the kind that, you know, it gets bigger, bigger, and then the middle one is the tallest one, and then it gets smaller and smaller. Because so they, call it, they, they, they call it a hedgehog? Hogback. That's a hogback jump. Okay. Hog back. I, call it a hedgehog. I, I don't actually know that those are legal anymore. I haven't seen one of those since I was like 12 years old, but that is a hogback. Oh, okay. Yeah, they right? may so not the have middle. one of those anymore. I don't know that there is. I don't know that they're Ill illegal, but I have never that, That's seen not the one, one that we have now. The one we have now is like, yeah, uh, the, it's and small, and bigger. then every, right, yes. right. Yeah, right, yeah, the hog back is what it was referred to. And the middle board was the highest, and then it would go down. Uh, from a training standpoint, it was nice in flow of sequence because you could take it either direction. Mm -hmm. So as a person who designed sequences at my facility, I liked those because you could take it both ways and it visually looked the same to the dog. But now we have the ascending where the last board, the back board is always going to be the tallest board, and the front board is always going to be the shortest one. Gotcha. Yeah. And for AKC, that's, that's it's a max of four boards. And for USA and UKI, it's a max of five. So the number of boards, in addition to the range of length, can vary from organization to organization. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an obstacle, I think, that uh, for some dogs, for a group of dogs, is a massive extension obstacle. Uh, the handler almost never asked for a turn in training. And so what judges were doing for the past several years um, on these uh, tougher courses, international courses, for sure, not here in the United States, um, uh, was to ask for turns. Yeah, I was going to say ask out of all of these... Them. I, Nothing crazy, I've seen, not a wrap, but like 90 degrees. Right. I have seen a lot more turns after broads than I have after triples, doubles, tires. Right, yeah. right. But so, I, I guess because there's, uh, I, I guess I would uh, take a guess that the, um, the downside to doing that is a lot less in terms of injury risk. Like you don't want to ask for a really tight turn at a tire and risk some of the competitors getting hurt, but nothing terribly bad is going to happen with the broad if the, uh, if the handler hasn't trained a tight turn after the broad. 
And uh, I think there's a couple challenges that can be presented with a turn off the broad. One is the dog hitting it, but the yes. other is the dog cutting through on a diagonal, yes. which yeah. is exactly. a different fault, right? Hitting it, being a knocked bar, cutting through the side, depending on the organization, a refusal where you have to come back around. So you can kind of present more challenge as a judge or a variety of challenges when you have a turn off of the broad jump as well. Yeah. Right. And I think it's such a big deal that, um, uh, uh, especially here in the United States, like most judges are giving you very straight approaches, very straight exits. And I remember one year when we got to, uh, tryouts and they had it, uh, a lot of dogs struggled. And then I think the following year, they also had a tight turn after it. And, um, um, the, uh, the U S coach changed the course for yeah. large dogs, you know, making it uh, easier. I think one of the the for for AKC competitors specifically, I think one of the really sort of bizarre things about the broad is that it's required at the novice level <laughs> right. and then it's not required in the upper levels. And so you almost never see it. But then where does where does it magically reappear? Nationals. Many it used to. I feel like it's been a while since it appeared in nationals, but it used to almost always be at nationals after not being anywhere all year long. So I, I don't So we actually Actually keep track of this in both our AKC nationals and invitational prep courses, right? Yes. So people who sign up for the prep courses and they train with us, they know exactly what the obstacle profile use is for the organizations for that specific event. And we trend it over the last seven or eight years. Right. So they know exactly what the trend is, what the probability is that it's going to appear in this week, this year's courses and all that stuff. Yeah. But in very fact, interesting. we're doing that right now for the uh, invitational prep, um, which if you're listening to this podcast, you know, as we release it, that uh, course is available right now for registration until Monday the 19th. But yeah, we talk about how often you're going to see the tire, the double, the triple, the broad. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that's, you know, I frankly don't understand that about the broad. I'm like, either get rid of it or don't. Um, I think it's very bizarre how it uh, is required in the lower levels. And so um, I think for U.S. competitors, uh, there's really a, a lack of skill on the broad, frankly, right? Because right. we, uh, we just there's right. just no need to have a lot of skill there unless you plan to do things like uh, international competition. Yeah, And I think one of the reasons that we don't get a lot of skill on it, and uh, this would be consistent with some of the other obstacles as well, is and from a class standpoint, teaching group classes, doing group classes every week, it can be one of those obstacles that really is a pain to put in the courses. Oh, yeah. um, you know, you could have a class of six people and you might have four jump heights and you're going out there at the broad jump and none of the students know it. You have to get the tape measure. You have to make the adjustment. Yep. And I, I hate to say this, but as an instructor from some standpoint, it's just easier not to use it, right? It's easier not to get it out. We waste so much time. And I think mm -hmm. that's why you're more likely to see it at a national uh, event, whether it be invitational or nationals, because they know they're setting the jump height for hundreds of dogs. So once I set the broad jump, I'm not going to have to redo it again in three dogs or redo it again in five dogs. I'm only going to have to reset it when a dog hits it. So don't let that be a reason that you avoid practicing it, whether it means you as an individual need to go out there and train it more on your own if your club or your instructor is not putting it out, or maybe just a little friendly reminder to your instructor, hey, could we use the broad jump? Or ask, if I came to class five minutes early, uh, and I got it out. Could I go out there and replace it with an obstacle out there on the uh, course? And I think um, for the ascending obstacles, so whether it's the double, the ascending double, the triple, the long jump, before or after a teeter is always a good place because the mm -hmm. teeter is also only one direction. Mm -hmm. So if you have it before a teeter, after a teeter, it allows for pretty good flow on the course. But I think that is a factor for, um, for handlers as well and why it doesn't get more proficiency is they're just not doing it as much. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, um, <laughs> going back to the first thing, I mean, why, why would instructors spend a lot of time on it if all they have to do is get their students through three runs with it? And mm -hmm. then, you know, and then it's, it's just, there's not very much bang for your away. buck there. Yeah. yeah. In terms of time, but yeah, there it's, you have it's it. It's interesting that they would have it at big competitions, but I guess it's more of a, a crowd pleaser, I guess in general. Maybe, yeah, but, maybe. But so annoying to set up. Okay. Makes for uh, cool photos. Maybe those people want some cool photos yeah, out there. That's true. That's true. Uh, from their yeah. national events. Project photos are pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's a good point, too. Uh, panel jump. And Ooh, I, I'm going to tee think, this up for you, oh, you because are, okay, the panel ahead. jump was your 
nemesis with, with your first Jordy dog, Diana. your novice A dog. Tell us a little bit about that panel jump experience. She was perfect in everything. She was going to just be, you know, she was uh, practically perfect in every out. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Golden Retriever, beautiful dog, Gypsy. And uh, there's this psychedelic looking panel. It had like, uh, you know, those art paintings, Jennifer, where you, you, it's like a pattern. And if you stare at it long enough, it'll, the thing will pop out to you like a three-dimensional shape, like, you know, the... Uh, yeah, you like cross tower. your eyes and you, yeah. you yeah, see. Yeah, it, looks, yeah. it looks like a pattern. You cross your legs, right. eyes, and it's like a... That was a very like 80s a, thing. Yeah. 80s? Oh, yeah. 90s. 90s. 90s, yeah. That's yeah, yeah, very yeah. 90s. Well, okay. So the panel jump looked like that. And when she encountered it in the trial, you know, she'd been on a regular panel jump in, in training, and then she showed up at a trial. And on her novice run, she just dead stopped and she wouldn't take it. Nope. And then she just went around it. I tried to get her over it and she wouldn't do it. And she refused it all that weekend. Right. And so it was the second weekend, same venue. Right. I didn't have access to it, but she was willing to try it. And after that, she was fine. So, you, you know, Jen, you pointed out uh, before we started this podcast, something very interesting about the panel jump that doesn't apply to any of these other extending obstacles. And what was that? I think the, the a big reason that dogs have trouble with the panel jump, and I will add, we haven't gotten there, but the wall jump included, is it's the one obstacle you can't see on the other side. Yeah, right? Exactly. I mean, you, 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 they could be jumping into a lava pit for all day. Exactly. Right? I mean, exactly. You commented with the tire, they could like see the dog walk underneath. Yes. So it presents a different problem. But imagine, you know, running up to a wall and saying, you have no idea what's on the other side, but I want you to jump it. And <laughs> right. I think... Right. I mean, for us as, as humans, that's scary. Imagine a dog. Um, so I think it takes a lot of reps on a lot of different panels for a dog to generalize and know that when they jump it, the other side is in fact just going to be the ground. And I think there is a little bit of an advantage and disadvantage for dogs that are taller than the bar versus dogs that are smaller than the bar. Because, you know, you take an 18-inch dog up to a 16-inch panel, or maybe they're jumping preferred and it's 12 inches, they might be able to see over. So they're going to be more confident. But you take a 14-inch dog up to a 16-inch jump, but that, that lack of knowing what's on that backside and that lack of visual, I think, can be very, very scary for dogs. Yeah, and yeah, I think it like, is something... I, we assumed it was this, this psychedelic appearance, but it could very well have been that thing that you're talking about. Right, and I think that um, I think that a lot of people with experience, a lot of instructors recognize this, but I think a lot of uh, newcomers to the sport, um, they don't recognize that aspect of the panel. They just think of it as, you know, there's it's a panel jump, it's just a different kind of jump. They don't think about that effect on the dog of not being able to see the other side. Yeah, you know what? Think about this. The next time you're watching a Netflix movie and the bad guy's escaping. Everybody's going to think about panel jumps And they're from now jumping on. over the fence. So if it's a regular, let's say it's a very short chain link fence. They don't have to climb it. They can just jump right over it. It's like three or four feet. You know, they're just going to jump over it. If it's a chain link fence, they see the ground on the other side. But if it's a solid brick fence, they could jump over it. And then it could be like a 20-foot drop or something, right? <laughs> right into a pool. Yeah. Who knows? You know, that's usually how it's going to go. Yeah, they're going to jump and then it's going to be a swimming pool and they're going to be okay. And hilarity ensues. Yeah, yeah. We've been watching a lot of Netflix movies. Okay. But um, yeah, so I think that's true about the panel. I think dogs take off a little bit sooner than they need to for the panels. The panel is a, is a high-risk knock for dogs with jumping issues. So, um, you know, uh, and, and I'm not talking about early jumpers. I'm just talking about regular old fashioned bar knockers. You know, I've had several of those, uh, most recent dog gets you definitely a bar knocker and she would drop the panel at a much higher rate than normal bars. So I just want to throw that out there for people who aren't aware of that. And so, you know, it's an obstacle. I think you want to get, uh, dogs more exposure to, especially on slices, um, I'll, I'll have dogs uh, wrapping and doing panels as backsides as well to get them more comfortable. Um, the last one, oh, also I got a good story about that one is the viaduct or the wall jump. And this one you see exclusively in international competition or international type runs here in the United States is this monstrosity of a brick wall with these big posts, like these columns, like uh, of a house. Like a castle. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, it can be very physically intimidating for the dog. And I took Gitchy to her first tryout, I think. Was it the very first one? Anyway, they had a viaduct there and she just refused. They had it as the uh, warm up. And we've been doing we've been doing plenty of she'd wall done, jumps. She she done tons but they of had, viaduct. She was did tons really, of it was like a runs. big homemade one, so it was even bigger than the like ones that you buy commercially. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like if I was building a castle 
from our 10 year old daughter, this, this could very well be the one, one of the four walls of the castle. Like it was huge. It was huge. <laughs> right. right? right. Uh, like you could have a puppet show behind there. Anyway. Uh, so she was refusing that. And so they, they put that out in, um, I think that was the warm up day. Yeah. Warm up day. She refuses. Yes. They put so it as a they put it, And she was not the only dog. There were dogs that like freaked out and like border collies that just ran right out of the ring. And they were like, no. And so what they did was they put it as a warm up jump and that would, you can get plenty of reps. So right. yet we had to go back to basics. It was like, jump over, here's a tree, like lower the height and everything. And slowly, basically like teach the obstacle right there Yeah, in your warm up. And so like, there's like three or four of us whose dogs like utterly freaked out and, and we're just like, uh, you know, taking turns. I, it was, it was very cool actually. And like supporting each other and, and trying to get our dogs to do this thing. And then of course, as soon as the competition was over, what did we do? We came home. I, what did we do? I wonder. <laughs> what? <laughs> you commissioned and I built <laughs> an exact so replica it was, it of was this a team, effort. Job, team was, effort. And, uh, and then and, of course they stopped using it. Yes. The very next year. So <laughs> like I came home and I built this thing and I mean, I had pictures of the original one from all angles and uh, I built this huge thing. I'll put pictures into the show notes. I built this huge wall jump. And not only was it this, not only was the very, very large, it had like, um, a brick veneer. It was like wallpaper that looks like brick, right? Mm, so mm. I went on, you know, YouTube, I mean, not YouTube, I went on Google and I found like brick wallpaper and I wallpapered the wall jump that I made mm. and then painted it like it was exact, like an exact I think that's match. part of it. I think maybe dogs know what brick is and they're like, I'm not jumping into that. Well, I think, I think a, in addition to, so I, I, this doesn't explain- It'll the, hurt um, my toesies. That's true. This doesn't explain the refusing, but I think another aspect of the wall jump that you have to consider is like, if you're a dog, why wouldn't you push off the top of it, right? If mm. you were jumping over an actual real it. wall in a real world situation, why would you clear it without touching it when it's sure. a nice, big, solid, sure. like wall, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's another aspect of the wall viaduct that you have to teach them is, yeah, I know it makes sense for you to jump onto it and off of it, or at least to push off the top with your rear feet. But sorry, you can't do that on this one. <laughs> Jen, have you run into viaduct issues for either you? Well, you generally run s smaller dogs mostly um, or, or your students getting ready for these. Well, things. I think a lot of people look at the wall and they're like, Oh, it's just a panel, but it's not. I mean, a panel there is no depth, there is no width to it, right? Yes. It's just a normal PVC. For those that aren't familiar with the wall jump, it's still solid like a panel, but now there's there's width to it. So I don't know what the dimensions are, maybe four inches. Um, yeah. You know, and as Sarah said, yeah. a lot of dogs yeah. would be inclined to kind of push off of it. So it is a little bit different. And my big recommendation for people is, because there's two factors to this, and you've touched on both of them. It's a, it's a solid wall panel that they're jumping, but also these big, massive columns on the side. And, um, you know, I think for a lot of dogs that have issues, it's hard to tell which element is it. Is it these super tall columns that are way taller than a wing, way mm -hmm. bigger and bulkier, or is it the panel? And so what I like to do is I like to teach the jump with them separate. So I take the, the panel part, the, the part that they're jumping, and I will just put it between two normal wings and let them Brilliant. jump that and get used to that. And then I'll take the columns and I will put them on the sides of a normal wingless. Right. And then just have them a normal wingless jump and incorporate that in when the dog's proving proficiency and the handler is comfortable with both aspects, then you can bring it together. Right. And then you can say, okay, now we're going to have a big solid jump and these big wings. I mean, for some people, I'm going to put myself into this part of what I don't like about the walls is darn columns from a handling perspective. Cause I'm used to putting my arms right over the jump on some yes. skills or moving my hand over a, a jump or something. And you can't do that with the wall because they're, they're sometimes sitting taller to me. So there are so many factors. We, we could almost do a whole podcast on the, on the viaduct or the wall jump, mm -hmm. um, but separate the two elements. It's just like science, one variable at a time, do the uprights, do the panel part, put them together. It's not something that we use a lot in class because it, in AKC, it's only allowed in Premier. Uh, right. But this podcast has reminded me I probably should get it back out um, <laughs> and use it a little bit more because, as you mentioned earlier, with the long jump or the broad jump, it is often pulled out for the, the bigger events. So there's a lot of factors to take into account with the, with the wall jump. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, I feel like um, – I feel like – 
the wall, I feel like the viaduct has fallen out of favor um, in a lot of places, including international. It used to be the standard. So the difference between the wall and the viaduct is the viaduct has a semicircle cut out in, in the middle of it, right? So it creates it creates a tunnel underneath the thing, right? And right. so for, um, especially for dogs that are undersized relative to their height, which happens a lot in international competition because there are fewer jump heights. So for us, we were we had a um, 17 and 7 eighths border collie who has to jump 26 at the time, right? Right, but would normally Why jump 16. Would normally jump 16. So there's this huge, massive a semicircle, you know, essentially half of a tunnel underneath this jump. Why wouldn't you just run through that tunnel? We 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 ask her to run through tunnels all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think, especially for the undersized dogs, um, that the viaduct presented that additional challenge of no, 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 no cheating, <laughs> right? Even though there is a clear path that you know essentially through the obstacle, that's not how you're allowed to take it. And so you had to work through that as well. Um, now I, I rarely, rarely see a viaduct. It seems like it's always a wall now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I couldn't tell you the last time I saw a viaduct, probably at tryouts years ago. I can't that even tryouts when I made that seen viaduct. One. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. The one I made was a actual viaduct. Viaduct, viaduct. <laughs> Man, did we just throw that away? That thing was huge. It was like took up the whole driveway. Oh, uh, we as gave big it as an to, SUV. We gave it to one of our uh, training partners to keep at her place where we used it more often. Oh, uh, okay. And then I think we gave her permission to throw it away if she wanted to. Uh, everybody switched to like Max Two Hundred, the better, yeah, smaller, like a, more carryable. Right. Even then, they're pretty obnoxious to set up. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of setup, I think that's the one thing we'll conclude this podcast with the theme that ties it all together. These obstacles in general are going to extend your dogs a little bit. They're going to take off a little bit earlier. They're going to really fling themselves over. They may have flatter trajectories. They may mistime their jumps based on the visual cues that they are picking up. And so you as the trainer need to spend a little more time on these obstacles, but you probably don't have access to them. You know, people add add weaves and, and contacts as they have issues with them. They have jumps, they have tunnels, um, but they're not often adding these specialty items. So you need to make sure that you you have access to them. You're getting access to them. If you know your instructor has them, maybe give them a little nudge. Hey, Jen, can, do you think we can, you know, maybe add in uh, the, the tire, <laughs> the, the triple, the whatever you were having problems with at your last trial and you just need to uh, get your dog on it and not just once or twice or three times during the sequence that you're running in class, but have a little quick dedicated session. Can I get five minutes with this obstacle and do a little bit of work on it uh, to uh, really build value for it, get a lot of treats or, or play into my dog here, give them a lot of different approaches to really boost their confidence so that they know, hey, I don't need to take off from a million miles away at max speed. There are other ways that I can safely navigate this obstacle on course. All right, perfect. Well, that's it for this week's podcast. We'd like to thank our sponsor, hititboard.com, and also remind everybody that the Invitational Prep is now open for registration. It closes on Monday the 19th. And um, this is a course of small space exercises. And we call it the Invitational Prep because it is built around the AKC Invitational, which is a competition here uh, in the United States coming up in December. But this is really a great course for anybody who wants to work on their skills in a smaller space. Uh, it's going to give you um, exercises and ask you to handle them in a multiple different ways. So like, for instance, uh, front cross, rear cross, blind cross, so that you really see what your strengths and weaknesses are and kind of um, build up your weaknesses uh, and um, also just know what the best options are for you and your dog so that whatever your next trial is, you're better prepared. Um, we also do course map analysis of all of last year's invitational courses. Um, and there is an option for a working spot or audit spot. So if you do a working spot, then you'll be getting feedback from myself and Jennifer on your exercises. Uh, so if you're interested in that, check it out. There will be a link in the show notes, or you can go to baddogagility.com slash invitational. Happy training.